evening, but I represent uh, Lieutenant Russell Graham in this matter, and I have some questions for you today. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, can you just please uh, tell the commission commissioners um, what your uh, position is and where do you where are you employed? I am Sergeant Corey Borchang. I'm the Louisiana State Police Cadet Class Coordinator at the Training Academy. Okay. Uh, tell me, what, what what are your duties as Cadet Class Coordinator? Um, I handle the the day to day planning and logistics of the Training Academy of the Basic Cadet Class. Okay. And how long have you been in that position? Three years, sir. Okay. And were you cadet class coordinator for class 100? I was. Okay. And uh, can you tell me um, when that class went through training academy? I'm sorry, when that class started? Yes, when did it start and when did it finish? Do you remember the dates? I don't have the exact dates in front of me. It was in uh, 2022. Okay. I don't remember the, the start and date so off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. That's fine. And um, how many years have you been employed with Louisiana State Police? I've been with Louisiana State Police for 15 years. Okay, and how long have you served at the Training Academy? I am in my, I just passed five years at the Training Academy. Okay, thank you. <coughs> How many cadet classes uh, have you been involved with at the training academy? At, at the training academy as a full-time staff member, I've been involved with four, or I believe 102 might have been my fifth class since I've been on staff, but I've been involved with every class in some form or fashion going back to class 92. Okay, thank you. Can you just um, briefly describe to the commissioners what is the, the role of the training academy as, as it relates to cadets? As it relates to cadets, our, our goal or objective is to produce basically trained troopers capable of entering to the next phase of field training with the ultimate goal of becoming solo capable patrol troopers. Okay, and um, can you can you tell us how how do um, how do the instructors achieve these goals? So the goals of, of basically training them are that we need to ensure that they are physically, mentally, and you know, even emotionally capable of handling the the rigors of the duties of a Louisiana State Trooper be able to go out and effectively do their job in a safe, efficient manner for both themselves and for the, the public that we serve. Okay, thank you. And um, what sort of techniques have you seen in the past that instructors have used uh, when, when trying to um, uh, assist cadets or in trying to motivate cadets to push, uh, to, to push past uh, the goals or achieve goals during the training academy? So every, every cadet is the same as every person. They come with their own things that motivate them. Some people are internally motivated. Some people are externally motivated. Um, some of the skills that we use in the past that, use that are still effective are you know, those that are no different than youth sports and, you know, Sometimes you have to get loud and, you know, kind of motivate them externally to keep pushing themselves, even when they've given up on themselves as a staff. You know, we, we know where their boundaries lie or where they should lie, and we have ways of seeing those things, and you can continue to push them and not allow them just to quit, which is the natural human attribute is when things get hard to stop doing this. Okay, and, and during this, um, 
do, do, does, do the instructors ever um, add stress to, to the situation as a way of... Objection, I'm bleeding. That's sustained. Okay, I, I, I will rephrase. Um, let me ask this. Uh, are you familiar with Lieutenant Russell Graham? I am. How long have you known him? I have known Lieutenant Graham since I was a cadet. He served as a what we call duty officers at the time for my, my cadet class in 2008. Okay. Um, have, uh, have there been any situations you're aware of where any cadets have requested to work with Lieutenant Graham in the pool during training? Yes. Can you tell me about uh, that, please? So, historically, we have, or over the last couple of years, we started to try to give the cadets that were non-swimmers or weak swimmers the opportunity to improve their skills, and we would bring them down outside of the normal PT workout and give them time. And I know that um, Trooper Jones had worked with Lieutenant Graham and other staff members on his, his ability to swim, and by the end of his academy, he went from what I would categorize as a a true non-swimmer to a to a swimmer he expressed at different times that he had taken his children to swim lessons and they went to a public swimming pool so that was a huge huge accomplishment for him and that was something that i know trooper jones was proud of and i was proud that you know the training academy and lieutenant grant specifically were able to make that happen And um, which cadet class was Trooper Jones in? Uh, he was in class 100. Okay. Are you familiar with uh, Kevin Blake? I am. And which class was he involved in? Class 100. Okay. Uh, did you have an opportunity to observe uh, Kevin Blake during training? Yes, yeah, I've observed him on a daily basis and uh, was involved closely with all of the uh, issues that had arisen during his training. He had been counseled several times on his performance, and I was the one that uh, actually processed him when he resigned his position as of today. Okay. Um, <coughs> did you, uh, who, did you um, how are you aware that he uh, was counseled several times? several times? Uh, I verbally had counseled him personally several times. I saw other staff members counsel him and then and also I had formally in writing counseled him multiple times throughout the training academy for different violations of uh, policy and conduct. Okay. And as cadet class coordinator, is that your role to provide that counseling? Correct. I, as the cadet class coordinator, I do serve as the cadet's first line supervisor um, from a commission to side. So any formal counseling or recommendations start at my level. Can you, um, because we're on Zoom, I, I don't have the ability to share documents with you, but uh, can you uh, recall what sort of issues um, that could it, could it like had that required counseling? Oh, okay. Objection, uh, objection. Uh, relevancy. I, I'm gonna let that in. You, can, you may answer the question. Okay. Oh, if I recall correctly, all of Mr. Blake's counseling related to his physical performance and his effort during physical training, there was multiple times where the effort or lack thereof was was evident and not only affected his performance, but the performance of the entire class to the point that um, training had to be adapted around him or he had to be removed from the training so that the rest of the class could continue on with what was the prescribed training that that day. 
Okay. Um, can you give us a, a um, tell us, uh, did you see this, these sorts of uh, performance um, did this occur over the entirety of the training academy or just at various times? Can you give us an idea of that, please? It was, it was a pretty standard, regular occurrence that almost a daily occurrence would have, have warranted a written uh, counseling for his performance. There were days that we actually had to take him and put him on the treadmill where we could get a pulse just to show him that his pulse was still low for even the normal human range, you know, while he's in the middle of a workout. So it was almost a daily occurrence that he was counseled on him for one. Okay, and were you aware of, of any uh, barriers or impediments to, to his physical performance? None that were brought to my attention, and I had spoke to him several times during the counseling sessions um, as to what needed to be done, and Mr. Blake always indicated that he felt or believed that he was giving 100% effort. Okay. Um, you or someone else had to check Cadet Blake's heart rate or, or uh, do any of the other things you just spoke about? Uh, how many times was that done? I, I don't recall. That wasn't, that wasn't a very regular thing. That was more of a one of those items where we were trying to motivate him by showing him that you know his heart rate wasn't even in a state that would cause him to be out of breath or to be winded that people going up a flight of stairs would be higher. So the actual checking of his heart rate wasn't done on a regular basis. That was one of those uh, attempts to find a motivator to get him to, to put out a little more effort. Okay. Um, as far as uh, pool physical training with Cadet Blake, uh, what was your, um, you, you observed him during pool PT training, correct? Correct. And what, uh, was uh, Cadet Blake able to swim? Mr. Blake was a person who was able to, to swim. He would not be what I would categorize as a non-swimmer. Um, I would say he was a weaker swimmer but he had the physical capabilities and the skills necessary to be able to actually swim <coughs> and keep himself um, safe in the water. Um, during pool physical training, um, what what um, what are the cadets wearing during that time? Can you explain to us what they are wearing? So the cadets during uh, the, the workout oh, and along with the uh, the staff, some of the staff at times, they'll be wearing their regular PT uniform, their shorts and shirts under a set of military style PDUs. They, the top and bottom, so it's long pants and long sleeve shirt that has been historically worn and on most days, at least one staff member is dressed in the same attire doing the workout with them. Okay. And all, all cadets are required to swim in, in this attire? They, they are. They're required to, to be in the water in that attire. Uh, obviously, the non-swimmers are further to the shallower end, where, but they're still in the water with those, those on. And it becomes part of the, the process. And as the academy progresses, we start to incorporate those items of uniforms in a, uh, into the workout as they, after they've taken them all. Okay. Uh, do you recall um, pool physical training on February 16th, 2022? I do. Can, can you, uh, do you recall Blake, uh, Cadet Blake's performance that day? 
Yes, it was um, substandard. And on that day, we had entered the pool as we had always gone. Normally, what will happen is the cadets will enter the pool, they'll tread water at the beginning, and then they will move to each side of the pool and they'll begin to swim back and forth, exit the pool, do certain exercises, and do multiple repetitions of that. Uh, during the treading of the water, you know, they're expected to tread water and not touch the sides of the pool, not touch the bottom of the pool, and not touch each other. Um, Mr. Blake continually moved over to the side of the pool and grabbed the side of the pool. I told him that he had to tread water. That was part of the, the exercise. Um, um, we got past the, the initial treading of water, and at some point during the swimming portion, Mr. Blake was falling so far behind that it was actually interfering with the other cadets in the class' ability to, to swim. Everybody's supposed to be swimming in one direction. He is so far behind that he is swimming essentially upstream as to the, the direction of everybody else's swimming. It became a situation where he, he was impeding their ability to safely and adequately do the workout. And, and I elected to remove him, you know, after several attempts to motivate him and get him to keep up with his classmates, we moved him to a portion of the pool that was away from the other cadets that would keep him from interfering. Okay, at that point when when you decided to uh, move Cadet Blake to a different area, was he uh, still wearing his BDUs? I believe so, but I, I would be remiss if I said with 100% certainty if he still had them on, but I would have I would believe he did because it was still early in the in the workout. Okay, and is that a point of the workout where you would assume all the cadets had their BDUs on? Yes, if if one had them on, they they all had them on. They took them off as they as they Um. I, okay, and can you tell me um, what does BDU stand for? Uh, BDU is called several different things depending on your military brand. It's BDU stands for Battle Dress Uniform, but uh, it also is Army Combat Uniform, uh, Marines call them Camouflage Uniforms. They're essentially the, the utility uniform worn by members of the military. They're just a durable fabric that are able to uphold, and they're very similar to what our Class B uniform in Louisiana State Police has been in the, in the past. Okay. Uh, you testified earlier that uh, in full physical training, one of the goals is that you don't want the cadets to touch the sides of the pool or the bottom of the pool. Can you explain why that is so? That is to ensure that they're actually working. One of the benefits of the, the pool workout in and of itself is that it eliminates the ability for people to take short cuts, take unnecessary breaks. Um, there are times where they touch the side of the pool and they, they do break, or they, and obviously the non swimmers are in shallow enough water where the, if they stand up, they can touch the bottom. But touching the side and touching the bottom when you're supposed to be swimming or treading water is just a way of, of resting, and it's counterproductive to the to the exercise that's being instructed at that time. Okay. Um, how how do um, how do you communicate to the cadets that they're not to touch the sides of the pool or the bottom of the pool? They are told specifically don't touch the sides or get off the side of the wall. Don't touch the at the bottom, you know, keep swimming. And if, and if a cadet were to do that, were to touch the sides of the pool or the bottom of the pool, uh, how do you view that? That is a violation of of an order. And they're, they're told to, to not touch it, and it would be, you know, corrected on the spot. You know, hey, stop touching the wall. You know, you know keep swimming. Don't touch the bottom. Okay. Um, so, so you 
testified that Cadet Blake um, was moved away from the group he started with. Where did you move him? So he was moved to what would essentially be the middle of the pool. Lengthwise, uh, our pool starts at four feet and then the deep end is 15 feet. So there is a section that's kind of a transit uh, grade on the bottom of the pool. So most of the non-swimmers are on that shallow end and the rest are further down. So there's a little bit of an area in that transition where the pool is six, seven, eight feet deep where we don't really have any any cadets swimming. But there's a ladder on each side right there. So it's a kind of a natural barrier. And I moved him to that point where the water would still be deep enough that he would not be able to touch the bottom, but he would be able to swim unimpeded for himself, but also unimpeded to the rest of the class. Did you instruct him not to touch the bottom of the pool or the sides of the pool at that time? Correct. His instructions were to swim, to enter the pool and swim across. And at several times when he would move towards the shallow end or to the, to the ramp where he could kind of bob down and touch the bottom, he was verbally told multiple times to not touch the bottom and not touch the sides of the pool unless touching the side of the pool probably wasn't one of the instructions because he was swimming across, but he was at one point was told to swim across and turn around without touching the side and come back. And, and he continually tried to work his way to touching the bottom or when he was near the walls and he was told not to touch it, he would still want to reach out and take those, those breaks. Okay. Were you, were, was your entire focus on Cadet Blake um, during this training session, or did you have focus on others as well? Uh, I still was observing the rest of Cadet Blake that became kind of my primary focus as the rest of the staff was dealing with the, the other group, the rest of the class. But uh, obviously I was not 100% solely focused on him only. I was still, you know, visually checking the rest of the class to ensure that one, it was a safe training environment, but two, that uh, everybody was doing what they were supposed to be doing. Okay, did, did you see um, Lieutenant Graham uh, on, on this day on, at the pool on September, I'm sorry, on February 16, 2023? I did, okay. I did. Um, did you see him uh, work with Cadet Blake at all on this day? Yes. Okay, tell me what you... On uh, that day, primarily where I remember Lieutenant Graham specifically was after I had moved Cadet Blake to that middle section that we were just speaking about. Lieutenant Graham was actually in the water to and swimming alongside of him to ensure that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, giving him motivation to keep going that he can do it and Cadet Blake had a had a history of he would swim with his eyes closed and swim kind of wildly at times so he was continually moving towards that shallower end and Lieutenant Graham was directing him you know to stay in the straight line that would keep him in the, the depth of water that we wanted him in. Okay. Um, did you see any any physical contact between Lieutenant Graham and uh, Cadet Blake? Yes. At one point, uh, Cadet Blake was swimming towards the uh, shallow end again with his eyes closed, and Lieutenant Graham kind of turned him, you know, just put his hand out for Blake to bump into, and it appeared to me that it was an attempt to get him to swim the right direction, and then. Uh, Cadet Blake started had made comments off and on that he wanted to quit, that he was, you know, wanted to stop, and he grabbed on to Lieutenant Graham, Lieutenant Graham had pushed him away. Now at this point both are still in deep enough water where neither one can touch the bottom and still have their head out of the water. Um, so I saw Lieutenant Graham push Blake away. And that happened on, on one or two occasions and then Mr. Blake was, you know, calling out that he wanted to quit. Please, please help me. 
I, I quit. And at that point, I remember telling Mr. Blake to get out of the pool that he intended to, to quit the academy. Then, you know, we would move on to that portion. And that went back and forth of uh, him wanting to quit. And then when he would be presented with the opportunity to resign his position, if that's what he intended to do, he would go back that he didn't want to quit. And so we'd have a conversation I'll be a short conversation that if he's not going to quit the academy, if he's not resigning, then he needs to fully commit to doing what is what is requested of him. And that was the, the extent of the, the contact that I saw between Lieutenant Graham and uh, Mr. Blake. And at no time did it seem anything other than you know, Mr. Blake grabbing on to Lieutenant Graham and him just trying to create distance between the two. Okay, so in your opinion, did uh, did you feel that the interaction between Lieutenant Graham and Cadet Blake was appropriate? Objection, maybe. Sustained. What was your impression of the interaction between Lieutenant Graham and Kevin Blake? As far as from, I... from Lieutenant Graham's uh, actions. I've, I've had no no issue with the, the contact. It was not a uh, punitive action. It was not an abusive action. It was a directive and self uh, self protection. As Lieutenant Graham was also in the in the water, and it was not actions that I felt if I had been in the same situation in water that I couldn't touch the bottom and another person grabbed onto me that I would have taken by pushing him away him or her away. Did you perceive that Cadet Blake was in any uh, danger? No. Not whatsoever. Did it appear that he was panicking in any way? Cadet Blake? No. It, it, it was Cadet Blake's actions were very consistent with other actions I had seen from him and in him throughout the academy. It was not a panic-stricken or inability to you know, that he feared for his, his personal safety at the time. Okay. What What did you do at the conclusion? Let me ask you this first. Do you recall how long did that pool physical training session last that day? Uh, each day the, the pool, well, PT starts at 5.30, the cadets come down, and they're done before 7. So the uh, pool usually takes a little while to get them, get them through the, the normal morning workout, get them out of their shoes, and get them into the pool. And then we have to get them out a few minutes earlier so they can dry off and stack up their, their uniforms, get their shoes back on, and get ready to go to breakfast. Uh, are you lifeguard trained, Sergeant Bortrading? I am. Um, <clears throat> do you recall, uh, given your interview uh, with Internal Affairs with respect to this incident? I do. Okay. Uh, do you recall discussing with the investigator what, what your opinions are as far as what, when it's appropriate to put hands on a cadet? Uh, I remember speaking about it. I don't remember my comments exactly. Okay. Well, just share with commissioners what you remember that, that you stated. I, I'm out to object. Um, I think we already stipulated, you know, concerning the, there's no policy concerning the uh, well, she's not asking about a policy. She's asking him to remember what he said he saw. Uh, you may answer the question. Oh. Uh, I would, again, I don't recall exactly my exact words, but to me, it's a, uh, it would be appropriate to your hand on a cadet if it is for the safety of 
cadet or of a staff member, there are times that you know, cadets will find themselves in positions where the immediate nature requires you to put your hands on them, to physically direct them to where they're supposed to be go point versus <coughs> being able to stop them and verbally explain where you need them to go. At the conclusion of full training on February 16, 2022, do you recall uh, what you did after that? At the conclusion of training on the 16th? Yes. Uh, I believe I, I did possibly a counseling on Mr. Blake, but I don't recall anything else out of the ordinary. Did you make a recommendation for termination of Cadet Blake? Yes, correct. That was, yes, that later that day we did uh, start the process of formally documenting everything and bringing all that together. And I did draft the letter. It wasn't immediately following, but it was that same day, later in the day of uh, recommendation for termination for Mr. Blake based on you know his poor performance and his actions throughout the academy, not specific to, to that one incident or that one day. And who does that rec who did that recommendation go to? So each recommendation for termination that I submit, I will submit it to the operation lieutenant who at that point was uh, Lieutenant Jackson now Captain Jackson, and then it would go through the training academy commander, through the command inspector, over training, the major, and through the lieutenant colonel, and up the chain of command, ultimately to the uh, superintendent's office for action or decision. Okay. Did you make Cadet Blake aware that you were recommending him for termination? I, I did indicate to him that he was being recommended for termination. And uh, as a practice, when I write those letters and the unfortunate times that those come up that I make those recommendations, I make the, the cadet aware that they did it being done. I also make them fully aware that I have no control over the decisions that are made. I am merely making recommendations based on, on my observations and my beliefs of their ability to do the job. Uh, so I make no no belief in their mind that a decision has been made. And I tell them specifically that up until the point that the superintendent makes a decision, they will be continuing to train just as the rest of their class is. Um. Do you recall when did you tell Cadet Blake you were recommending him for termination? I don't recall exactly when I told him. Okay. Um, did Cadet Blake ultimately um, leave the, the training academy? So the, the following day, uh, when we got to PT, Mr. Blake and I had a conversation. He agreed that he had not done the workout from the previous day. He had not done the work that his classmates had done and that he was behind his classmates when it came to the level of work. Um, we went back to complete the, the workout and shortly thereafter, Mr. Blake refused to train and indicated that he was wanting to resign his position in the Louisiana State Police Training Committee yeah. And did so. Okay. Um, one more question about the counselings that you testified about with respect to Cadet Blake. Do you, sitting here today, have, uh, could you tell me how many uh, written counselings you recall giving to Cadet Blake? Well, I'm just ready to see. Tell you the exact number. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I don't have 
anything further for this witness at this time? So I'll, I'll tender the witness. Ms. Brown, Michelle? Yes. Uh, so then, Bush, you indicated it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, sir? Yes. You, I hear you. You indicated during your testimony that one of your primary duty is the safety of the cadet. Is that correct? That is correct. So a chokehold on a cadet in a pool is not guiding the cadet. Objection. This is this is cross. Objection. It's assuming facts that are not in evidence. We can use the word chokehold. He just said he chokehold. It, it's okay. You can ask the question. Uh, ch is chokehold on a cadet the same as guiding the cadet in, 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 in the water pool? Uh, well, no, a chokehold is not, but uh, I don't know where where that is is at. But yes, if, if you're going to, I guess we would need a definition of of a chokehold. I don't, I don't know exactly what you're referring to. Did, did you have opportunity to look at the video? The only time I watched the video was when I, when you brought me to the, the legal office and, and showed me a video. Did you agree with me, sir, that as a video surveillance in the, in the pool area? Yes, I agree that there was video surveillance. And did you agree with me, sir, that the video surveillance uh, accurately captured the events of February 16, 2022? I will agree with you that the video captured the events. I will not necessarily agree. I, I believe we may differ on some of the facts that the video shows, but I agree that the video did capture the event. Okay. You indicated in your testimony that uh, the performance of uh, Kevin Blake uh, affected the entire class. Is that correct? That is correct. That's correct. You also indicated in your testimony that you remove cadet Blake from the training usually on a daily basis. Is that correct? On several occasions, yes. What are the other recalls for a trainer when a cadet does not perform? What other recourses for a trainer? Uh, we have to find ways for them, but ultimately, if they refuse to perform or are unable to perform, then the, the ultimate recourse is to recommend them for removal from the train. You know, we, we use that as a last resort, and we hope that we can find the skills to motivate that cadet to do the actions that are required of them. Is there any training value for repeated pulling and pushing in the pool. Is there any value for a cadet? I you get broke up. Can you repeat the question? Is there any is there any training value when a cadet is being pulled and pushed in the pool repeatedly? Pulled and pushed by by who? By by the trainer. There could be if that was part of the if that was part of the training of evolution. What was what was the value of pulling and pushing on Cadet Blake in the middle of the pool? Cadet Blake was never pulled or pushed on, other than when he physically grabbed onto Lieutenant Graham or when he was being guided because he was swimming blindly in the direction that he wasn't supposed to swim in. <clears throat> but you, you did indicate to me that you agree that the video surveillance is accurate, correct? No, I agree that there was video surveillance of the incident. I, I think you and I may differ on what that, that video showed. You have removed Kevin Blake from the pool workout. I I moved him. I didn't remove him from the workout. I moved him to allow him to do the workout in a different area that would unimpede the rest of his classmates. Would that be the best practice? 
in that particular instance, yes. So, so let me ask you one more time. So there is no training value in pushing him to the deep end of the pool. Okay. Is that correct? Objection, asked and answered. So there is no training value when Lieutenant Graham pushed Cadet Blake to the deep end of the pool. When Lieutenant Graham guided Cadet Blake to swim in a straight line in the air, in the depth of water that he was instructed to swim in, it, yes, there is training value. By allowing him to go into shallow water where he can touch the bottom, he loses the training value of actually swimming. He's standing in water, which is not physically exerting, which is different than swimming and not touching the bottom as instructed. There's also training value in following orders and uh, completing the duties that are assigned. What was the value of pushing uh, Kevin Blake? Abstraction, asked and answered. Uh, I'm not, you can overrule it. What is the value of pushing Kevin Blake by Lieutenant like Gray? just answered, it requires him to swim one in a straight line, so he's actually swimming a shorter distance to the other side of the pool versus the angle that he was swimming on blindly. But the training value is to keep him in the water where he cannot touch the bottom and the rest. And he is physically exerting himself as is instructed versus resting, which is what he was instructed not to do. You indicated earlier that you're a lifeguard, correct? I recently allowed my certification to lapse as we had a emergency with one of the cadets during our recertification class. But uh, at the time of this, I was a certified lifeguard. During your testimony, during your direct, you indicated that as a lifeguard, you, you created distance between you and the cadet. Is that correct? I don't believe I testified to that, but I testified that, yes, if someone is getting on you and you're in deep water, the, the best thing is to get away from that person, especially if you're not trying to affect a rescue. Okay. Objection, asked and answered. Objection, asked and answered. Objection, asked and answered. Did you saw the interaction between uh, Lieutenant Graham and Kevin Blake? I did. Did you intervene? I did not. You indicated <coughs> that it's for safety. Why did you intervene? There was no safety violations occurring that needed intervention. So, grabbing someone by the throat is not a safety issue. specifically grabbing anybody by the throat. That is a characterization that I think has come from from you that I didn't see that he grabbed him specifically by the throat. They were it's two people in water that they can't touch and he pushed him away in the upper chest. But also when you're treading water, the upper chest is about the most that's out of the water. So pushing someone away, there was no grabbing of the throat, there was no choking or continued motion uh, that, that I saw moving. Um, Sergeant Bush, I know you didn't have the opportunity to look at the incident report of Lieutenant like Graham, but I'm going to read what he stated in his incident report, and I want you to comment on that. In the incident report, and I quote from Lieutenant like Graham, he said, I reached up and grabbed him by the throat and he immediately released his grip. That is the statement from Lieutenant Graham. Okay. So, so grab this all by the throat. Let me uh, go back to my question. Does that create a safety issue in the pool? In and of itself, to, to affect the release and separation of the parties? No, not necessarily. Isn't it true that you are not in the pool area at all times? No, I'm not there 100% of the time. I have other duties that don't know exactly what you're 
referring to, but no, I, I'm not there 100% of the time. recommendation for termination, correct, on before the resignation? Correct. Did you finish writing it before the resignation? I believe so, yes. Right. Now, I'm not going to use the term chokehold, but did you see uh, Lieutenant Graham place his hands in the neck area on it, this leg? It was the upper chest, neck area, yes, they, I mean, they were as I said, you know, the, the upper chest, and obviously there was some splashing going on, so it wasn't a clear, unobstructed view, but it was in that general upper chest neck area, but it was not anything that I would, that I deemed to be a safety issue at that time. And, and Lieutenant Graham indicated that at some point he placed his hands on Mr. Blake's neck. Are you aware of that? I am now. Okay. I had been directly involved in, in what their incident report said. I, I, I took them, I may have read them as we, we poured them up the chain of command before this process initially started, but to say that I knew that for a 100% fact or had remembered that, but I do now know that, yes. Okay, so you do remember it now? Well, I, I remember, I heard it today. Uh, I don't remember him specifically saying that or seeing that in his, his statement, but it, if it's in his incident report, then I'm sure I saw it at some point. When you saw uh, Lieutenant Graham place his hands in the back area, upper chest, whatever area you saw, where in the pool were they? They would have been almost the, the exact middle of the pool, length and widthwise. What, would, what is the depth of the pool at that point? Seven to eighteen. All righty. And uh, you said that uh, Mr. Blake went back the next day when he and to try to complete the the exercise again. Is that what I so, understood? Correct. The next the next day uh, before we started PT that morning, I verbally counseled Mr. Blake, and we spoke about. Uh, how it is unfair to his classmates and he agreed that it was unfair to his classmates that they have to do a level of work that he is not or was not doing. I asked him if he agreed that he had not completed the workout and done all the repetitions that his classmates had done the day before and he agreed. Uh, we went back to the pool and on the first or second swimming of the, the distance, 
he got out and stopped and stated that he was going to resign from the, the training academy. At and that time, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You have something else you wanted to say? No, sir. At that time, had you already completed the write-up for the recommendation that he be terminated? Correct. I believe so. Okay. And you were going to turn that in regardless of whether he completed the process? Uh, it had been, I, without looking back at my notes, I will say that that had already been completed and submitted at least to my first line or my, my immediate supervisor, but had already started its way up the process. Was Lieutenant Graham present on the second day when Ms. Blake was trying to, or at least went back to purport that he would try to complete the process? No, he was not. That's all I have. Anyone else? Is this witness released uh, by both parties for the rest of the day? Yes. yes. That's correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, you are you are free to return to what you were doing in California, and you will not be called again for the rest of the day. Thank you, and I will I will honor the sequestration and not watch anything else in mm -hmm. any event that I'm, I need to be called elder. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I turn my off. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, this time we'll take a, a recess until one o'clock.